All right, it's Dino here with a guy who not only is a DJ, but uh, he's a musician and he's an author. And quite frankly, I think he's overqualified to be working here at the radio station. Our new night guy, host of Hard Drive XL. Say hello to Lou Brutus. How you doing, man? I'm doing really, really good. Um, I'm so stoked to uh, to have my book out this week, my memoir, Sonic Warrior. Uh, the state of the world is not what I expected it to be when I released my <laughs> book, but um, you know, I'm 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 glad in a way that um, it's given people a laugh and a much needed break from all of their uh, uh, worry and toils. And uh, yeah, and I'm stoked to be with you guys too. It's uh, it's just all worked out that uh, I've I've joined ranks with you uh, at the time the book is coming out. So. Uh, you know, even for all the crazy things happening out in the world, it's a very exciting time. Absolutely. Now, yeah, you're on from 7 to midnight now, uh, every night, Monday through Friday. Of course, we may have had, or some of our uh, listeners may have had a, or their first exposure to you on Saturday nights with your show, Hard Drive. But this is Hard Drive XL, so it's extra large. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the show. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the weekend show, we've been doing that for... I think about 24 years now, Oof. and it's been the first place that people have heard bands like Slipknot, Stone Sour, Avenged Sevenfold, Seven Dust, uh, and a long list of so many others. And uh, uh, the uh, the two hour weekend show did so good, we expanded to a five hour a night, five night a week uh, week night edition, and uh, that's gone over like gangbusters and. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a great way to make a living. Uh, you know, when when people find out what what I do for a living, they're like, "Hey, well, you know, so what are you doing?" I'm like, "Oh, I, I talk on the radio, and I interview rock stars, and I'm a photographer, and uh, I'm in some crazy bands, and I'm an author." And and they they think you're you're pulling their leg. You know, they right? Think, yeah, I'm making it all up. Pick but, one uh, lie. Pick one lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, it, uh, but th then they find out it's legit, and, uh, you know, most people get a, a kick out of it, so, and, and that's really kind of what the book came out of, just because, you know, I'm doing this for so long, and I've had so many experiences with so many big bands all over the world that, uh, you know, it, it added up to a, a lot of crazy stories. Well, now let's talk about that a little bit, uh, your journey, I guess. Uh, you started off in radio back east. You're originally from New Jersey. Now, were you uh, a guy that was a radio guy first and then a music fan, or were you always a music fan first and then a radio guy? You know, they, they came, that's a great question. They, they came almost at the same time. Um, I, I, like you mentioned, I grew up in New Jersey, and, and I grew up in a little tiny town called English Town, New Jersey. And it, it's sort of the halfway point between New York and Philadelphia. And that meant growing up, I got radio and TV from both cities, as well as all the New Jersey radio stations, of which there were many. So there were just literally dozens of rock stations when I was a kid to tune into. And I loved the radio. I loved the music. And really, from the time I was six or seven, I knew I wanted to do something with music, probably in radio, just because, uh, you know, the, the DJs I grew up on sounded totally cool to me. And I, I thought it, it was incredibly glamorous. Uh, and, and I knew I wasn't going to be a good musician. You know, I'm in a couple of bands now, but they're, they're kind of kind of goofy, crazy bands. Um, and uh, when I would start going to concerts as a kid, um, the only other person I saw up on stage besides the band were the DJs from the radio station introducing the show. And and I you know look at them and go well hell even I could do that right you know? it only like, takes hey, two minutes here's, <laughs> yeah here's the who you know here's uh, <laughs> here's Ozzy here's Black Sabbath you know right uh, here's the Ramones um, and and um, you know again the unique place where I grew up um, meant that I. I had access to concerts every night of the week. Mm. Literally, there were concerts every night within an hour from me in either bars and clubs or theaters or arenas. Some nights there were two, three, four or five great concerts to choose from between all the different venues within an hour or two of me. So um, by the time I graduated high school, I had already been to a hundred shows and I'd seen a, a lot of real absolute legends 
Uh, and I've, I've just kept going with that the last few decades. Where are my comp tickets? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Well, that's it. You know, it's funny you say that. That's part of the reason why I got into radio, uh, because I, I just thought, well, I can't afford to keep going to concerts like this. I started working two, three jobs from the time I was 12 years old just to pay for all the concerts. But again, it, it, it all kind of feeds into why the book is the way it is. It, it's It's all separate stories. Each chapter is a separate story, a standalone story. And it's from all of this crazy stuff that's happened to me with all these rock stars, mostly around attending concerts. And the opening chapter in the book is is sort of the introductory chapter, the sort of background bio chapter. And it's entitled, The Time I Attended My First Concert and Threw Up on Carlos Sanchez. <laughs> and it's about my first... It's about my first concert, and uh, my older sister and her boyfriend, whose name was Carlos, took me to my first concert, which was Black Sabbath and Ted Nugent at Madison Square Garden. Wow. And I had the flu. I I, I had the flu. I shouldn't have gone. Um, And I got there, and in the excitement of the moment, I thought it would be a smart idea to down an entire bottle of Boone's Farm strawberry (laughs) wine in one throw. Well, that was not a good idea. Uh, And what happened was I passed out. I missed all of Black Sabbath, woke up to leave, and then started power vomiting all over (laughs) everyone and everything in Madison Square Garden. And that was my introduction to rock and roll. Uh, And since then, I've been to to north of 3,000 shows all around the world. Uh, including uh, so many historic events, and and I write about a lot of them in the book. Some of the other chapters are things like the time I went to the Arctic and got in a mosh pit with a bunch of kids in polar bear fur (laughs) while Metallica sang about sodomizing a goat. (laughs) That's a typical Tuesday for you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just another day ending in Y. Uh, But that's about uh, being invited by Metallica to travel with them up to the Arctic to a private show in an Inuit village called Tuktayuktuk. And uh, it literally was uh, not only in the above the Arctic Circle, but above the tree line. So you're in tundra. Nothing grows higher than your shin. Wow. And Metallica did a show there. And, and the closing song was the cover of the punk song, So What?, in, in which there is, in fact, goat sodomy. Uh, and it's just, that's, that's what they close the show with. But, but anyway, uh, again, each chapter is a separate story. So you've got things like, the time Motley Crue's roadie showed me the grossest thing in the history of Western civilization. <laughs> the time our tour bus ran over a guy on the New Jersey Turnpike. And um, that was about traveling with Stone Sour. And we clipped a guy on the Jersey Turnpike wow. and, and went sideways and blocked the entire New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> uh, the guy turned out to be okay, or else I wouldn't have put it in the story. Um, and, and by the way, speaking of Stone Sour, Corey Taylor was kind enough to write the foreword for me. Uh, he is an old friend. He shows up in a couple of the different chapters and, uh, again, wrote the foreword for me, which is real great. But uh, all of these dozens of stories all together make up the book. And, and the full title of the book is Sonic Warrior, My Life as a Rock and Roll Reprobate, Tales of Sex, Drugs, and Vomiting at Inopportune Moments. <laughs> and it's already become the... Uh, the number one new book in a number of the charts and categories on Amazon and uh, uh, the reviews have been through the roof and uh, I'm just uh, really happy it finally came out this week. It's been a a labor of love for several years and uh, it's finally out. And I would also, if people want to check out some excerpts, uh, hit my website, lubrutus.com, and you can link through to um, uh, some of the magazines that have excerpted it, including Revolver. Revolver oh. Magazine has taken the, a chapter uh, called The Time I Escaped the Wisconsin State Police and Their Fake Phallus Felony in- Enforcement. <laughs> and, and that's about me. I, I, I was dressed up as Hunter Thompson chasing a stark naked, except for plastic uh, and duct tape around his junk, uh, Corey Taylor, uh, he pranked Shadows Fall, who were opening for Slipknot that night, and he and I were prancing around on stage while they were trying to do a number, and the Wisconsin State Police showed up, and they were not happy. <laughs> they, they were not happy. So uh, so that chapter is about that night, which is 
sort of gone down in infamy. It's uh, yeah, it's a fun read. It's all these crazy stories, and uh, again, I'm just happy that it's uh, uh, it's it's sort of raising people's spirits amongst everything that's been going on. And I, I know you're a big Hunter S. Thompson fan, and you got the chance to meet him a couple times. But I have to ask you, what is your favorite Hunter S. Thompson movie? Is it uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, or is it Where the Buffalo Roam? You know, they both have their pros. Okay. Uh, mostly pros, uh, as opposed to pros and cons. Um, Bill Murray as Hunter S. Thompson is 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 genius, but it's sort of a low budget film when it's just Bill Murray on screen. Uh, particularly when he's locked up uh, in in Hunter's uh, in in his home, right? Uh, in in Woody Creek, that's really great. You know, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is by my favorite filmmaker Terry Gilliam, mm -hmm. and there are amazing cameos in it, like uh, uh, you know, uh, throughout the film. Uh, so that's probably a far better made movie, yeah. and Johnny Depp is absolutely brilliant as Hunter. Uh, and there is, in fact, a, a chapter on Hunter in the book. Okay. Uh, the chapter is entitled, The Time Dr. Hunter S. Thompson Menaced Me with Depraved Violence and a Bottle of Chivas Regal. <laughs> and it goes into my meetings with Hunter. And uh, he. I, it wasn't like we became best friends or anything, but uh, for reasons that I go to in the chapter, he thought I was really cool and really ballsy and... Um, uh, I had uh, he shouldn't have thought that. And when you go into the chapter, you'll understand why he thought it. Um, but um, um, at one point, he I kind of met the real Hunter Thompson and not the crazy guy that he portrayed. And he was a he was actually a real uh, he was a Kentucky gentleman. And uh, it's uh, it's one of my favorite stories in the book. Uh, just for my personal preference, I love where the Buffalo Row. My favorite scene. Uh, is the uh, the courtroom scene that 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 always gets me every time? But uh, <laughs> that's just well, me. well, and 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 um um oh, oh um the actor's name is escaping me now. Coach, who played Coach? Oh yeah, uh, Craig, Craig T. Nelson. Yes, uh, Craig T. Nelson plays the the cop who's committing perjury on the stand. Right, absolutely, and he's a famous University yeah, of Arizona yeah. graduate here from Tucson. I knew that, yeah, because uh, they they often they they always put him on college bowl games when he shows up. So, that is you true. Know. That is true. And you're a big football yeah, fan. Yeah. Uh, your band, the Dead Schembechlers, uh, obviously referring to Bo Schembechler, the uh, the Michigan coach. Uh, tell me a little bit about your musical endeavors. You know, I'm I'm, I'm part of two crazy bands. Uh, the, the, I'll mention the other one first. Uh, it's sort of a comedy punk rock band called grumpy old punks mm -hmm. and it's me with the guys that i've known since grade school uh who, who all became professional musicians and, and went on to different uh bands um and it's punk rock about how getting old sucks it's like middle age <laughs> punk rock rage and the songs are things like anarchy in the prostate <laughs> hey you kids get off my lawn that's no milf that's my wife <laughs> um, and, and we get that back together time to time. The other band you're referring to, the Dead Schembecklers, uh, is, um, is based on the Ohio State-Michigan football rivalry. We dress like the old Ohio State coach, Woody Hayes, with the old man <laughs> 50s glasses and the uh, red jackets and black ties. Um, and we sing horribly offensive, obscene songs about how Michigan sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the songs, the songs I, I can't mention most of the song titles, right? Um, but some of the song titles include things like "Ann Arbor Girls Are Dirty Whores," <laughs> "Bomb Ann Arbor Now," and uh, uh, one of my favorites, a song called "I Wipe My Ass with Wolverine Fur." Woo! Uh, yeah. And um, the the band accidentally, because we just did it as a goof. The next thing we knew, we were on HBO and ESPN <laughs> and ABC, and we, we accidentally became famous. And and the chapter uh, in in the book about all that uh, is is entitled "The Time I Accidentally Became a Rock Star as Well as the Most Hated Man in the State of Michigan." <laughs> and that that one chapter, I think, 
we've already had some film and television uh, inquiries about the rights for the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, I, and it's just people asking from, from, you know, L.A. and Hollywood. Now, Lord knows if anything will happen with it, because that, that still would be a long way off. But I'll tell you, if there was one chapter in the book that could be turned into a movie, it is absolutely this dead Schembechler story, <laughs> because it got so crazy where we were about to play a sold-out gig the night before the biggest game in the history of the rivalry with both teams unbeaten and ranked 102, uh, one and two. And Bo Schembechler himself was talking up the band that week <laughs> because there was such a hype on the game. And then an hour before we had our big press conference in the lobby of the sold out theater in Columbus, Ohio, Bo Schembechler died on live TV. Oh. <laughs> and, and it turned, it was just this, media firestorm and we were at the center of it um and uh it's it's about what happened and and how do we sort of extract ourselves from the situation uh and and i'm not saying this because i was a part of it but in my 40 years in the rock and roll business it is the craziest thing that i have ever seen or heard about whether i was involved or not and that's why i think if somebody like Cameron Crowe got a hold of it. They could turn it into an absolutely crazy, crazy movie. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, well, you're almost famous, so that that kind of works out. Uh, and and now that uh, you're working here in Tucson doing nights for us, we're going to have to get you to write some uh, pro Wildcat songs against our, uh, our, our in-state rivals here, the Sun Devils, the ASU Sun Devils. We hate those dudes, those scum devils. Well, F the Sun Devils. F the Sun Devils. That's what I say. I mean, you know, I, they're they're devils. So right there, right. We we've got to do some some sort of exorcism or something. You know, that that's what I would say. I mean, the when they hold thing, up their have devils and go ahead. I was going to say when you have devils and demons, exorcism. I could be the rock and roll exorcist. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am now dubbing myself the rock and roll exorcist. I cast you out. <laughs> Foul sun devil. Yes, yes. Well, you know, you know it's bad because their like little sign that they put up whenever their kids are on camera in the crowd is it looks like the shocker, but it's supposed to be a pitchfork. I, I so you know they're bad people. <laughs> well, and they're not very bright either. You know? <laughs> well, uh, tell uh, us a little I, bit. I, although I. I, I... I should say I, I I do have a diploma from them, oh. but it's only because I, I – well, it was in the Cracker Jacks box. Got so, it. You know, I, <laughs> I opened up the little packet, and there it was. There so, you. you know, don't hold that against me. Not exactly an a academic institution up there in Tempe. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about the show at night now. Of course, we have Hard Drive on the weekend still, but Hard Drive XL every Monday through Friday, 7 to midnight – uh, I'm hoping that you don't have your eyes set on doing afternoons here at the radio station. I'm starting to get a little bit self-conscious. No, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> I am uh, a creature of the night, uh, as Kiss and the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, both used to sing a long time ago. Yeah, it's uh, uh, five hours a night, five nights a week, uh, tons of rock star guests through the, uh, the course of the week. Uh, we have a featured artist. And that means that that rock star or band joins me as guest every night that week. This week, it's Matt from Trivium who's joining me every night. And then there's also a second rock star guest every night. And so there's five different special guests and one featured artist who joins me every night. Next week, Sully Erna from Godsmack is going to be joining me every night. I was the first to play Godsmack from coast to coast on the original weekend edition of hard drive and i've known those guys for decades uh i have traveled with them before and um you know so actually called me at home last week just to catch up uh we were checking in on each other's families and uh he was giving me a rundown of what he's doing their uh uh their new uh video is an incredible piece of work with these hundreds of middle school students that took part in the uh in the taping and the filming so uh yeah um i'm just Super proud of the show. We've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I can't believe I, I can talk about you know my career in in, in uh, chunks of time that long, uh, but I feel very fortunate to be able to do it. And again, um, sometimes when I feel like complaining about work, 
uh, my wife sort of checks me on it, and she's like, you talk to rock stars for a living and go to concerts. <laughs> Do not ever let anybody hear you complain about work because they'll just smack you upside your head. Yeah, don't let your wife meet my wife. They can commiserate together. <laughs> 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 they know they know that's right well hey uh lou it was awesome talking to you I, I i think i need to get your booker for my show but nonetheless check out hard drive xl every weeknight seven to midnight here on the station and uh, i really appreciate you joining me and uh we'll catch up soon all right i'm honored to uh to be uh on with you and to be on the station and uh again Thank you for the support of Sonic Warrior. And I just want to remind everybody one last time, they can buy the print version from Amazon or Barnes & Noble. You can get the Kindle edition, or you can get the audio book, which I read myself. You can get that from Audible, Google, um, iTunes, uh, Google Play or iTunes. It's out there for everybody. So thank you very much. Hey, was it weird to read, read your own book? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it really was. Um, and, and also, when while we were reading it, we found mistakes that are going to be that are in the first edition. I mean, it happens all the time, but it drove me crazy. Where we, like, you know, most of it was really minor, you know, little minor misspellings or mm-hmm. grammatical things. But there was one sort of car wreck of a sentence, like the editor didn't catch it. And, and, I, and again, I proofread it, I'm telling you, like a thousand times. Right. But still things get through. It's not like the old days, because, you know, much like radio, the book industry, you know, there's there's now 10 people doing the work that used to be 100 people. Sure. And now you don't have 15 editors going through it and proofreading. You have, you know, one, and they use spell check. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> you know, so, so things get through. But, uh, you know, we fixed it for that read. And then in the uh, – apparently the book's selling like gangbusters, so – uh, I'm hoping we'll do extra printings and paperback and all that kind of stuff, and and we'll fix everything and maybe add some new chapters uh, as well. So there well, you go. Low quality control is what what got you and me to the places that we are today. Again, thanks so much, Lou. <laughs>